we're going to finish up our study on the Sermon on the Mount today, and I wanted to uh, back up and cover a lot of it that we've already covered and make reference to some very specific points. So I'm going to uh, reference blocks of scripture and then make a comment from in that block. So if we don't go verse by verse, that's why. And if I say something that doesn't sound right to you, you know what to do about it? You look it up for yourself and study it out. That's what you should be doing anyway. So please do that. Having said that, let's open a word of prayer, please. Our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much uh, for our time here. We thank you for your spirit lingering here with us. And I trust that it would continue to do so and that it would speak into the hearts and the minds of us as we uh, learn and draw closer to you through this study. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so as I said, we had uh, several installments in this series, and I wanted to bring it to a close today and review some very specific points. And let me begin by um, referring to a, a message that I heard many, many years ago, actually. Pastor Dan Karam, uh, I, I trust everyone has the same thing happen to them. They hear a message. And something very specific in that message really speaks to them and sticks in their heart and their mind and, and it stays with you forever, apparently, because I have a few of those. But Pastor Dan Karam, many years ago, uh, he brought a message to us and, and it really spoke to me. And it's always stuck, as I said. And it gives me hope for my future, this thing that he said. And it gives me strength for personal growth, let me say it that way, and all that God has and wants of me, because I, like many people, have doubts. I trust everyone has doubts. Am I doing what God wants from me? Did I react properly? Did I say the wrong thing? And so this point Pastor Karen made reminds me that I, as well as other people, may not always be what and where they think they should be, but they may be what and where their time and place is meant to be for and in God's purposes. Do I have you curious yet? Anybody? Pastor Karam said two Greek words that stuck in my heart and my mind, and it's teleos and teleosis. And some of you may have heard those too. In Strong's Concordance, number 5046, teleos brought to its end, finished, wanting nothing necessary to completeness, perfect, that which is perfect. One com commentator put it this way, and I, and I really like this description. The New Testament concept of perfection found in the Greek word teleos, perhaps the best known occurrence of teleos occurs in Matthew 5.48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Certainly Jesus desires that we become as flawless as we can humanly be, using the utter perfection of the Father as our model. But his use of teleos suggests something else. His aim is that a Christian be completely committed to living God's way of life, maturing in it until he can perform the duties of God the duties God entrusts to him, both now and in his kingdom. In harmony with this idea of spiritual growth for his completion, teleos is well translated as mature in 1 Corinthians 2.6. In Hebrews 5.14, it is rendered as of full age. Perfect, mature, full of age. <clears throat> Pastor Karen went on to describe teleosis as a progressive state and process. So if you think of this process and perfection, that you are maybe perfect where you are, but you are not just compelled, but required to progress in that perfection so that you remain perfect in each stage that you are. Does that make that understandable? Hope so. To grow in knowledge and understanding so that you continue to be perfect as you strive to be more and more Christ-like. 
And that, I believe, is the key to the Sermon on the Mount, a person's personal journey to be a disciple of Christ, to be one whose desire is to be more and more like him, to become perfect in him. With that as our base of understanding, I want to do a quick review. Our study began with an explanation of a covenant and that the Sermon on the Mount was the introduction of the new covenant, replacing the old laws of ceremony and sacrifice, but reinforcing the commandments we are to live by, drilling down to the heart of the matter, becoming not what we could be, but what we must be. In Matthew, beginning in chapter 5, Jesus sat down with his disciples around him and began to teach them, beginning with what we call the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, beginning in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And I just wanted to repeat and point out, as I did when we went through these, that verses 3 and 10 both give the promise that the kingdom of heaven will belong to them. Verse 11 says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil about you falsely on account of me. And verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, because your reward is great in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. And again, borrowing from Pastor Karam and his commentary, be attitudes attitudes that we must be. Jesus encouraged those who wish to follow him in what is the longest recorded message that he delivered. It's important to remember that the entire three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, are all Jesus' words. Jesus continues his teaching by addressing and expounding on one subject after another. Carrying on now in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, he says, We as disciples must be salt and light to the world, a preservative, a flavoring, a light to promote growth, and give hope in a very dark world. And again, it's important to remember that these elements are essential for life and growth. Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 to 20, Jesus is teaching about the law, that he came to fulfill the law and commandments, not to abolish them. Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 through 26, the subject is anger. Not just we show others, but much deeper heart issues. Those thoughts of the mind that we cling to and don't let go of. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30, he speaks about lust. That not just physical betrayal is wrong, but the thoughts of the mind are just as bad and maybe even worse. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, Divorce. He teaches that divorce is hurtful and destructive and not to be used as a way out of a relationship. Marriage is to be, is to be between one man and one woman. Marriage is a union where two are joined as one and not to be torn apart. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. He's speaking of vows. He says that we must be truthful, doing what we say we will do. Unfortunately, the world we live in requires us to make an oath or contract because so many before us have not been honest and have not upheld what they said they would do. 
Disciples are required to do what they say they will do. Not look for a, or purposely use an escape clause, which Jesus says the Pharisees often did. And we spoke about Jesus referring to the Pharisees often as things not to do. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. The subject is revenge. We must always remember that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Jesus says, turn the other cheek, carry the load an extra mile. <clears throat> and we are going to talk more about the golden rule in chapter 7, but just to give you a heads up, the golden rule does not say do one to others first. It doesn't say that. But that's what the world believes today. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. Loving your enemies, I freely admit, I freely admit, I am fully aware of my shortcomings in this area. Um, the last eight years of my career were a time of almost unbelievable actions and reactions of the managers over me and the people undermining me from below. It was, as I said, it was practically unbelievable. But I'm still working on it, and I trust all of you can say that in areas that you struggle. Um, I can, however, attest that through all the situations and trials that I went through, God did make himself known many, many times. And I thank him for that. And those times were when I was able to let go of my own thoughts and let him work. I trust that to you too. Pray for those who spitefully, despitefully use and persecute you. It is like pouring hot coals on their minds. That is what we are taught and need to practice. Verse 48 says, We are to be found perfect in the situation, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. And that is teleos. That word perfect is teleos. We are to be found perfect, mature, full of age. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Giving to the needy. Be sincere, not to be seen by others. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you, as long as the attention of people is not your motive. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 14 is the Lord's Prayer. In it, Christ cautions us to be pure and honest in our prayers, not a performance for others. From that point, he teaches us an outline of the perfect prayer, and when we study the components, we realize the depth of what he has said. Uh, as an example, I highlighted this last time, I think, and I want to again. When we pray to our Father, we are calling on all aspects of our Father. Every aspect that Christ, Christ, Scripture identifies and those that He has revealed to us personally. And some of those examples are El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty, El Elyon, the Most High God, Adonai, Lord and Master, Yahweh, Lord Jehovah, Jehovah Ra, the Lord my Shepherd, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Elohim is God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. And I purposely saved Jehovah Nissi for last. That's the Lord, my banner. I did a study on this a while ago. Uh, some of you may have been here. The Lord, our banner. And I made reference to the tribes of Israel when they were in the wilderness. They all camped under their banner. Do you remember that, reading that? And I wanted you to reflect just for a few moments about the banner that you stand under. Uh, because we all do. And sometimes it's multiple banners. Um, a real easy one. Think of uh, the Olympics. Everybody know the flag with the three rings on it? That's a banner that people are standing under as they 
promote that athletic event. <clears throat> the American flag is a banner that we stand under. The Christian flag bears study. If you're not familiar with that, I, I encourage you to do so because every element on those flags means something. And I did not write it down today to give it to you, but it really is quite meaningful. Um, there was an event here in Jamestown today, I think people were under a rainbow flag. We, we aren't going to go there. But the point is, the Lord is our banner. That is the banner we stand under and need to remember and realize that, please. Our Father, this is who we are calling upon. He is all this and more to us. Call upon and lean upon. There are many other aspects of the Lord's Prayer. As I said, I'm not going to go into today. We covered that pretty well, I think, in the last session. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18, this, the subject is fasting. Jesus says to be sure you're doing it for the right reason. It was mandatory for the Jewish people to fast once a year on the Day of Atonement. And you can see that in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32. The Pharisees would fast two times a week just to impress others how holy they were. Again, Jesus was pointing out the shortcomings of the Pharisees. Jesus commented acts of self com I'm sorry, Jesus commended acts of self-sacrifice when it was done sincerely and quietly. He wanted people to adopt spiritual disciplines for the right reasons not for selfish reasons or for praise from other people. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24, Jesus is speaking about money. He calls on us to live contentedly with whatever we have because we have chosen eternal values over temporary ones, which are things treasured on earth. What we treasure most will control us. Keeping our eyes trained on a spiritual vision, seeing God's best clearly will keep our vision from becoming clouded with the world's desires. Scripture tells us a good eye is one fixed on God. For no one can serve two masters, God and money. You will love one and hate the other. Matthew chapter 6 <clears throat> Verse 25 to 34, he is speaking about worry. Jesus tells us it is unproductive and unhealthy. It is understandable in the age we live that with all the trials and things and tribulations and sickness going around, that we are all experiencing, Christ says not to worry about everyday life, our food or our clothing specifically. Verse 32 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and He will supply all your needs. There is a difference, however, between worry and concern. Worry immobilizes. Let me say that again. Worry immobilizes us and causes you to tremble with fear. Concern, on the other hand, causes one to take action. Action to seek God and plans for today and for tomorrow. Seek the kingdom of God. Planning for tomorrow is time well spent. Worrying about tomorrow is a waste of time. Careful planning about actions and reactions and trusting God to guide you will alleviate worry. Trusting God alleviates worry. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, Jesus is speaking about judging others. Judge not lest you be judged. I, I found in the past that th there is a lot of confusion and, and things about this subject. Some people say, oh, you should never judge anybody else. You should never judge. Well, the fact is that we do judge. Um, and I think if you consider for even just a moment, you will know that you do. Um, you come into contact with people and 
and have some sort of communication or whatever, and you can decide whether you want to continue to have contact with them because they are of like mind or spirit. And you judge that. You know, that's a very easy example to show you and tell you. So I, I don't want anyone to misunderstand. You do judge, but you're not to condemn. That, that's really what the root of it is, I believe. What I believe Jesus intends for us is to not condemn someone because of our judgments. Don't judge others is not a blanket to overlook wrong behavior, but a caution to have and use discernment. Jesus said to expose false prophets himself. We'll see that coming up in chapter 7, verse 15 and 23. And the Apostle Paul teaches that we should use church discipline when we see someone is out of order. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2. And that we are to trust final judgment to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 5, 3 through 5. We do judge others for many reasons, and I just believe that our thoughts and intentions for doing so must be done in the right spirit, leading to an end result, hopefully, that may be to bring repentance or restoration. But judging does not have to mean condemnation. Everybody with me on that? I hope so. I, I feel strongly about that because I've heard that misused so many times. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Jesus is talking about asking, looking, and knocking. Jesus uses the example of good parenting in this lesson. If a child asks for food, do you give them a stone? Ask and keep on asking, he says, for your Father in heaven will answer according to what he knows your needs are. And I think I said when we talked about this, maybe in another part, but I said Specifically, it's your needs, not your greeds. God knows what your needs are. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 is the golden rule. <clears throat> Treat others how you would like to be treated. And I add, first, treat others how you would like to be treated first. And that's proactive, not reactive. This is an action to spread good actions and attitudes in those we have contact, not a reaction to a negative experience with someone. Again, one of those areas, you know, if I'm driving through Jamestown, I'm not very compassionate with some people, <laughs> I have to tell you. Um, but. We all have our struggles. I trust God will work it out of me one day. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through and 14. The way to heaven. <coughs> Apologize for my voice. <coughs> chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The gateway is narrow and the path can be a little rough. And only a few choose it. Jesus is referring to himself as the narrow gate, and you must enter through it. The salvation he has offered you is the way through that gate. It's not an easy path, and you will meet many obstacles and challenges, but the eternal reward is the goal. And the alternative is the broad way, which many of the world choose focusing on the temporal rewards of the world today instead of the eternal. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. <clears throat> Fruit in people's lives. Beware of the false prophets and teachers. Jesus is warning us to look at the fruit of their lives. Are they really living a Christ-like life? Are they glorifying Christ and God in what they say and do? 
or are they lifting themselves up? Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And a serious warning from Christ, a tree that bears bad fruit gets chopped down and thrown into the fire. And just a reminder, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 15, says we will all stand before that white throne of judgment and we will be held accountable for what we have done and said. We had uh, I had a conversation just the other day with a friend of mine, some of you know my friend Larry. He said, my son stopped going to church and, and, he's, and he's listening to all these prophets. What do you think about all these prophets? And I told him, I said, today? Not much. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but there's not many there that bear fruit that I have seen. Not that I study them all, to be fair. I haven't studied them all out. I haven't studied any of them out, as a matter of fact. But you do have to be very cautious who you're looking at, who you're listening to, and how they're living and what they're doing. And from my very narrow perspective and experience, I, I know of one person in my lifetime that has really held a very high standard and has looked to it, and that was Billy Graham. Um, not that I've studied it out, I want to make that clear, but he's the only one I know of that really was upright through his whole life, and you could really take to the bank, so to speak, on what he said. Anyway. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 29. Building on a solid foundation, there are many people who talk and say the right things, but their walk does not reflect what they say. And again, just in the last couple of weeks, I heard of a, of a pastor of a very large congregation who uh, actually admitted and confessed to years of sin and was removed from what he did. Um, it's just mind-boggling. Get away from me, you will who have broken God's laws, it says this, this man, hopefully, has begun his walk of redemption. But many, I suspect, will approach the throne to give to God, thinking that they will be excused for some reason, that only they will understand. Uh, again, years ago, I heard a message from somebody, I, I think it was up on at Waverly, but I can't guarantee that. But again, one of those comments that stuck in my mind you know, some of these people will come before that throne in Revelation and they and they done something wrong for a long time and they just think God's gonna wink and say, It was okay. And that's not the case. That's just not the case. If you listen and follow my teaching, Christ says, we must walk the walk, walk the talk. So we will withstand the storms of life firmly planted on his foundation. Jesus makes the comparison of two lives that appear similar, but the one without the firm foundation is washed away. And that is our warning. We simply must remain on his foundation. The chapter concludes with a statement that his disciples were amazed at his teaching. It was like nothing they had ever heard unlike the Pharisees who drew from those who came before them, Christ stood firmly on his own authority because he is the Word. And John, beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the New Living Translation ends that passage with, the darkness can never extinguish it. The darkness can never extinguish that light. <clears throat> So 
So how do I wrap the study up? We've had this, I think this is number seven in this study, and we could have done much more, much deeper, but this is where we're going to stop for now. Jesus has delivered his longest recorded message to those who wish to be his disciples, those who aspire to be like him. He has delivered a new covenant based on love, grace, and mercy, reinforcing the intent of the old covenant, which had no way to, for people to actually live up to it. He exposes the hard issues that have held mankind to repeated failure. And so by giving us the tools to help in its application to our lives, we have what we need to succeed. Be attitudes. And the Lord's Prayer is a guide for us all to follow, to acknowledge all He is and does. And subject after subject, after subject on um, you have heard it said but I say to you so today my goal was to complete the study and give a reminder of at least some of the subjects covered I entrust it to God and hope that he has caught your heart's attention and it's somewhere and will cause you to seek more of him in your life and realize that the teaching Christ has given is meant to be tools for us to use that we might have success in life everlasting. So I end today with the words I began. <clears throat> and hopefully I encouraged you along the way. Telios, you could be perfect exactly where you are. You certainly can be perfect exactly where you are. And I hope you are. But teleosis is a progression and you simply must continue moving forward, onward and upward, to seek and obey so you and I will fulfill all that God has for us. Amen. Amen.